So uh, welcome to uh, this uh, Tisha B'Av class. I want to, uh, before we begin the class, I want to acknowledge that this uh, Tisha B'Av program is a joint program between UOS and Congregation B'rith Shalom, and I'm grateful to Rabbi Teller for his partnership. And I also want to let everyone know again that the entire Tisha B'Av program is sponsored by Doreen and Marshall Lerner in memory of Doreen's mother, Ruth Alpert, of blessed memory on the occasion of her 30th York site, which is on the, gonna be on the 17th of Av. Thank you, uh, Doreen and Marshall. And may your mother's neshama have an aliyah. And uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that she filled your life with song. We have been, not been permitted to listen to much song over the last, uh, uh, the last few weeks. So hopefully uh, our life will be filled with song once again when this fast is over. And we will think about your mother as we listen to our first songs post this period of mourning. Okay, the burning of the Talmud, Paris 1242. Again, if anyone has any questions as we're going, please don't hesitate to use the chat uh, and also to use uh, the raise hand function. I'll try to keep my eye on both. It's hard for me to see the actual screens while I'm sharing a screen. So if you're physically waving at the screen, I may not, I may not see you. Um, okay, what does this have to do with Tisha B'Av? Uh, well, because uh, it, if you participated in keynote this morning, or you may just know this uh, in any case, uh, that one of the keynotes, one of the elegies or, uh, or poems of lamentation uh, that we say on Tisha B'Av, is a poem written by the Maharam of Rotenberg, we'll get to him in a little while, about this event, about the burning of 20 or more than 20 cartloads, which represented thousands and thousands of manuscripts of the Talmud that took place in 1242 in Paris. If you go to Paris, I believe the spot where, these, uh, where this burning took place is still there, and there's a, a commemoration of a memorial plaque where you, you can see uh, where, uh, where it took place. And um, what led to, and so one of the keynote that we read is based on that event. What led to this event was a disputation that took place two years earlier. This is the first such disputation. After this, there were many, but this is the first such disputation when Judaism, in this case, the Talmud was put on trial and rabbis were forced to defend Judaism in the face of all sorts of claims um, uh, brought by, uh, by the Christians. Uh, one of the early sources uh, that we have uh, for, uh, for this event comes from a book called, uh, written by uh, Tzidkiyahu ben Avraham Anav. Um, I'm going to uh, open up, I'm gonna be switching back and forth between different uh, pages. Um, he wrote a book uh, called Shibole Haleket, which is 372 paragraphs uh, dealing uh, with uh, the laws, halachot, Shabbat, brachot, uh, Purim, Pesach. It's a Sefer Halacha from the Middle Ages. He's a Rishon. Uh, we see uh, that he lived in Rome and received his training in Rome and also uh, in, uh, in Germany. So this source says as follows. The, uh, this is source number one. I hope you could see it. I'll just uh, highlight the first line so you see, uh, so you see where I am. The al sha'anu oskim behilchot ta'anit uv'inyan sreifata Torah. Since we're dealing in the section with the laws of fasting, and what happens when a Torah is burned. He says, while I'm on the topic, let me talk about something that happened in our time, right? He died in 1280. So he lived at this, at this time. He wasn't in France when it happened, but he must have heard of, obviously he heard about it. He's living at this time. And he gives the years, right? Biyom shishi leparshat vizot chukata Torah. On Friday, before the reading of parshat chukat, 
כעשרים וארבעה קרונות מלאים ספרי תלמוד והלכות ואגדות נשרפו בצרפת. That he says 24 cartloads uh, full of Talmud, different books of halacha, books of agada were burned in France. כאשר שמענו לשמוע אוזן וגם מן הרבנים שהיו שם שמענו. So he said we heard rumors about this and we also heard directly from the rabbis who were there, שהיו שם, and we'll talk about who they were in a few minutes. שעשו שאלת חלום לדעת אם גזירה היא מאת הבורא. They did a שאלת חלום. It's a, they had some sort of way you're able to ask a question and ask a question of God, whether this was from God, this decree. והשיבו להם ודא גזירת אורייתא. The answer that they got when they did this special type of mystical way to ask a question, Aramaic, da gizerat oraita, which means this is a decree of God, which is in Hebrew, zot chukat ha-Torah, right? And that's right when it happened. It was that, the, the parsha right before uh, that uh, parsha was read. Upeirusho biyom vav zot chukat ha-Torah hi ha-Gzeirah. The, the, their understanding of, of, of the answer to this dream was that since the answer was da gzeirat to oraita, this is a gzeira of, of God, of the Torah. They understood that this is from God and that it was specifically on the Friday before Parshat Chukat was read. And therefore, umeoto hayom ve'elach, in the bold, it became customary in some communities for some individuals to fast, to commemorate the burning of the Talmud on the Friday before Parshat Chukat is read, based again on the response to the query that they put. And they also note something interesting. Most of the times when we have holidays or fasts, they're not on the day of the event, they're on the date of the event, right? Tisha B'Av doesn't always fall out on Thursday, but we always commemorate Tisha B'Av on the 9th of Av, no matter when it comes out. But here, they didn't do it on the date, they did it on the day of the week. And the reason they did it on the day of the week was because of that answer that they got from God, the translation of which is and it took place right before that, that they, they asked, uh, that's when they asked the question. So they specifically connect it to the Friday of that Parsha. And that's why they do not do it on the date, but rather on, they don't do it on the date, but on the day connected to the Parsha. Okay, so that's one of the earliest, if not the earliest source that we have for this event. Again, he says that he heard it, uh, rumors, and that also, um, also, uh, the rabbis there uh, who were there told them about it. So who are the people involved uh, in this event? Uh, well, uh, the, the, um, the bad guy in this story is Nicholas Donin uh, from a place called La Rochelle in Paris, but there are a few La Rochelles in Paris, so we're not really sure uh, which one, uh, but he was a Jewish person who was a student of Rabbi Yechiel of Paris, Yechiel of Paris, who we'll get to in a minute. And he was a student of him for quite some time, but then he left Judaism and uh, ultimately converted to Christianity. And in the, the Jewish record of these events, we read the following. For 15 years, he was a rebel against the words of the wise men and believed only what was written in the Torah of Moses. So some say he may have been a Karite, who only believe in the, uh, the written law. Uh, but in any case, he gave up rabbinic Judaism. Uh, and so he rebelled. And he said, we only believe in the Torah of Moses without interpretations. And yet you know that everything must have interpretation. Therefore, we have separated him and then excommunicated him from that time on until today. He has been planning evil against us to destroy us all. These are the words of Rabbi Chiel of Paris, Rabbi Chiel of Paris. Uh, Nicholas's teacher before he 
uh, went off the derech before he left uh, Judaism. And these words were spoken to the queen, Blanche, at the time, who was very old at that time, or maybe she was the queen mother, uh, and she was at this disputation. And at the disputation, uh, before he begins to defend the Talmud, Yechiel of Paris explains uh, who Nicholas Donin was and why he was excommunicated from the, from the community. So he's the, uh, the bad guy uh, in, this, in this story. Then we have uh, a number of other uh, rabbis involved. There were four rabbis involved in the disputation who actually were there in the room defending the Talmud against the accusations, excuse me, against the accusations brought uh, by Nicholas Danin. The main par- person there is Rabbi Yechiel of uh, Paris, very important, um, very important rabbi at the time. Let's learn just quickly about him. Yechiel of Paris, um, uh, was a major Talmudic scholar and a Tosafist from northern France. Uh, he was a disciple of Rabbi Yehuda Messer Leon and succeeded him in 1225 as the head of the yeshiva in Paris, which had 300 students, which is pretty large. And he is the author of many uh, Tosafot. His best known student is the Maharam of Rotenberg, who I mentioned before, wrote the Kina, wrote the elegy that we read on Tisha B'Av about this event. Some people actually think that Mayor of Rotenberg was in Paris with his Rebbe, uh, either still studying with him or visiting with him at the time that the books uh, were burned. You see here, he's in the um, disputation uh, of, uh, of Paris. So this is Rabbi Yechiel of, of Paris. And um, we'll, uh, so he was, he's the main uh, person who was called upon to defend the uh, Talmud. Uh, After this whole event happens, he decides he wants to get out of Dodge. He wants to leave Europe. So in 1258, he, um, he, uh, he goes to, he goes to, uh, he goes to Israel with uh, some students and he establishes uh, the yeshiva of Paris uh, in Israel. And he's buried near Haifa on Har HaKarmel. Uh, According to some, some say he never left and he's died, he died in France. But according to this story, he very much wanted out of Paris. We can't blame him after what happened. Uh, another, the a next player is Yehuda ben David of Milun. We don't have that much about him. Again, a French Tosafist, first half of the 13th uh, century, also involved in the disputation in Paris. Next, we have uh, Shmuel ben Solomon of Chateau Thierry. That's how you pronounce it. Um, uh, another French Tosafist. And finally, we have the other most, more well-known uh, person, uh, Rav Moshe ben Yaakov of Kutsi. Um, he was born in Kutsi, France, and uh, he wrote a book called the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, which I've seen suggested that he wrote that book after all the, uh, after the books of the Talmud were burnt, and he did that in response to try to recapture some of what was lost. And he collected and from memory uh, many ideas which he included in this Sefer uh, Mitzvot Gadol. So the, it's possible that the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, which is a very important book, would not exist uh, if not for the terrible event in 1242 in, in Paris. Okay, so those are the main players. The final player is the Maram of Rotenberg. Uh, fascinating story. He lived from 1215 to 1293. Uh, after this event, again, he was a student of Rechil of Paris. After this event, he decided to leave and go to Israel. On the way to Israel, uh, he, he got stopped and was accused also of blasphemy against the church and against God and was put in jail. Uh, he was put in jail. He was put uh, in prison. Um, and um, the, there was a large ransom which was um, requested in order to set him free. Um, and he said from jail, do not pay this ransom because if you pay this ransom, they're only going to do this more. They're only going to kidnap more Jews 
This is what more people in danger. Um, and um, so he refused and he actually died in prison. Um, and after seven years, uh, he was in prison for seven years and he died there. 14 years later, he was ransomed by Alexander Ben Solomon Whitman, who uh, was laid to rest next to him in the cemetery. Over here on the side, you see a picture. To this day, you can go to the Jewish Cemetery of Worms and you could see Rav Meir of, of, of Rotenberg, Maram of Rotenberg, is buried next to this person. And the reason he's buried next to this person was because this person was the one who uh, paid the ransom to get his body out of prison. And Maram of Rotenberg is the one who wrote the kina that we read on Tisha B'Av. So those are the main players. What are the charges brought against the Talmud? I have a list of them. Well, I'm sorry, it's not only charges against the Talmud, it's all sorts of charges. One are charges against the Talmud. One is that the Talmud, uh, was, which is the oral law, was also given by God, right? There are uh, mentions that we believe the oral law uh, was given by God, has its roots in Sinai, something the Christians couldn't abide by uh, because God only gave the written law. There are different things that they consider to be absurd claims of the Talmud, that the scholars can abrogate words of the Torah, right? The, the Torah sometimes says things, but the rabbis in the Talmud reinterpret them to mean something other than the literal meaning of them. People who do not follow the rabbis deserve the death penalty. These were charges brought against the Talmud, which the Christian church uh, felt were inappropriate. By the way, I should, start, I should have started by mentioning that these charges against the Torah, against the Talmud were brought by Nicholas Donin uh, to uh, the king uh, of France, and then the king of France sort of turned the case over to the Pope, to Pope Nicholas, and Pope Nicholas is the one who was the driving, the main driving force beyond this disputation. Another, some of the other charges were that there is hostility towards Christians, uh, it's supposed to kill, the Talmud says, kill the best of the Christians, permissibly to, permissibility to deceive a Christian, the difference in hell between Jews and Christians, ascribing certain behaviors to Christians, and then there are blasphemies against God, that even God sinned, or that God lied to Abraham, and there are blasphemies against Jesus, Mary, and uh, Christianity, including uh, the idea, and this is what we're going to focus on uh, somewhat, that Jesus um, is spending eternity in hell in boiling excrement, and obviously that is something that um, very much upset uh, the, the, the Christians, and, uh, and so they uh, brought their charges against, against Christianity. So again, we, we, have, we have records of this. We have the Jewish record of this, and we have the Christian uh, record of this. I didn't want to go through the actual language of, of the charges because I wanted to look at some of the excerpts um, from the defense uh, of the uh, of the uh, the actual defenses that we have. Okay, so excerpts from the trial. So we'll see some really interesting things here. Let me stop for a moment and ask if anyone has any questions or comments uh, that they want to make before we uh, continue. Please use the raise hand function or put something in the chat. I see Elaine, go ahead. There had to be a lot of anti-Semitism going along with that, correct? People well, yes, it was a period of, of, of growing anti-Semitism. It was sort of a weird type of thing where they weren't, um, they weren't massacring the Jews because the Jews needed to be kept alive so that their terrible lowly state can prove to the world uh, that they're wrong. But if you kill them all, there won't be anyone to serve as witness of how wrong their way is. So it was sort of this weird type of anti-Semitism, not, not about massacring them, but keeping them alive under terrible, uh, terrible conditions and, and sort of persecution. Uh, any other comments or questions? Scrolling quickly through everyone who's here. I don't see any other hands up or anything in the chat. Okay, let's continue then. 
let's get into the actual text of the disputation. So Yechiel of Paris says to Danan, what is your complaint? And so he says about Jesus, our Messiah, who has been blasphemed in the Talmud for many hundreds of years. So says Yechiel, the Talmud is more than 1,500 years old, your majesty. Do not compel me to answer him. Right, so the queen is there, and before Yechiel gets into it, he's hoping to get out of the whole situation. The Talmud is very ancient, and no one has complained about it before. Right, this is the first disputation and opened the floodgates to many other such events. Your learned Jerome knew all Jewish knowledge, including the Talmud, and he would have said something if there had been anything wrong with it, talking to a person in, uh, in her court who also knew the Talmud. Why should we have to stand for our life against this sinner who denied the authority of the Talmud and refused <clears throat> to believe in anything except the Torah of Moses without interpretation? But you all know that everything requires interpretation. This is what I read to you earlier. So she says, pay no attention to this guy. We've been coexisting for so long, and your people have known about the Talmud for so long, and it never bothered you before. This guy just has an ax to burn, has an ax to, not ax to burn, has an ax to, what's the phrase? I can't hear anyone. Eli Elisheva, what is it? An ax to grind. <laughs> an ax to grind. Thank you. He has an ax to grind. Pay no attention to him. Uh, but in the end, uh, he also says, even if you should decide to burn the Talmud in France, it will continue to be studied in the rest of the world, for we Jews are dispersed throughout the world. Our bodies, but not our souls, are in your hands. So that's a really beautiful defiance, right, of of what's going on here. Meaning, if you decide at the end of the day, we lose this disputation, you're gonna burn the Talmud anyway, it's not gonna work. Because the Talmud's gonna be studied elsewhere, and all you could really hurt are our bodies. And then she says, no one is going to touch you. I'm not sure who says that, but someone there says, no one's going to touch you, but can you protect us from the mob? And then the queen says, do not talk like that. We fully intend to protect you and yours, and our anger will fall on anyone who harms you, for so the people, the Pope has directed, answer Donan and do not withhold. So that's a very, very sort of full exchange with a, a lot is going on. Um, he tries to get out of it. Uh, he's concerned that they're gonna be physically harmed. Uh, but she promises that, uh, that even the Pope at this point has said not to harm the Jews. I can't imagine that this really made Yechiel of Paris feel any better. I'm not sure if he felt that the Pope was an honest broker here, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's what happens. So then Yechiel says, I asked the Pope, maybe he won't make me go through this. And she says, well, the Pope's behind this whole thing to begin with, and so let's carry on. So Yechiel says, do you believe in the four orders of the Talmud? And now here, um, Yechiel of Paris gives an interesting answer because what Danin is trying to do is trick him, right? The trick is, if, you, if I answer yes and say that I believe in everything in the Talmud, well, then I basically lost because you're going to quote things from the Talmud, which are anti-Christian. I've already said I believe in the Talmud, and so I have no hope. So by asking this question, it's a clever question by Danin, and Yechiel of Paris tries to dodge it as follows. I believe in all the laws contained in it, which were deduced by the rabbis in scripture. It is called Talmud, teaching, because of the text, you shall teach them to your sons. So Yechiel Danin here, and you see he's parsing his words. The, the Talmud has halacha in it, and that I believe in, 100%. But the Talmud has something else in it, he says. But the Talmud also contains Agadah. That is figurative, excuse me, figurative poetic passages to appeal to men's hearts. Among these are extraordinary things which are hard to believe for a skeptic or a heretic or a schismatic. But there is no need to answer you about these. You may believe or disbelieve them as you wish, for no practical decision depends on them. So he's trying to say all the things that, you're, that I imagine that you are going to complain about, I'm not, th th don't let those things bother you because they don't create a situation where a Jew has to do or believe in anything specific. They're just things that rabbis said over the time, believe in them or don't believe in them. But I know the sages wrote only truth. 
If these passages seem extraordinary, there are many similar passages in Scripture itself, such as turning Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, and speaking of Balaam's ass, and Elisha's reviving of the dead. Further, without the Talmud, we would not be able to understand passages in the Bible, which appear to contradict each other. And so he goes on to say, well, the Talmud is important, but one does not have to believe in, every, in everything that's said in the Talmud, uh, specifically those things which do not have any a practical a halachic ramifications. And that's, he tries to, uh, he tries to uh, get out uh, of, it, of it that way. Donin is unimpressed. I'm sorry, yeah, Donin's unimpressed. And he says, swear that you will answer truthfully and put us off with falsehood, with falsehood or subtlety. So Donin is up, he's, he's onto his game. Right? He says, I want you to answer me honestly and not dance around the question. I want you to swear. Michil says, I don't swear. The Torah requires an oath only in financial matters, not in spiritual matters. Anyway, who are you to demand an oath from me? This is an inquiry, not a trial. You are not my judges. Or if you are, I am equally the judge of you. Again, you see Michil of Paris um, is being, um, you know, he's fighting back. He's, he's not giving Don an easy time. And then Blanche, the queen, says, I request that you swear. Now, she may be on his good side, but she's the one who promised him that he's going to be protected. In any case, he says, I've never sworn an oath in my life, and I'm not going to start now. And she gives in. Since the matter is so difficult for him and he has never sworn an oath, let him alone. So that part is over. Yechiel of Dan is not, is not uh, forced. Yechiel of Paris is not forced to swear, to swear. And now we get to the issue uh, of the blasphemies against Jesus. So he says as follows. The Talmud contains blasphemies against Jesus. For example, the Talmud says that Jesus is in hell and his punishment is to be immersed in boiling excrement. Turning to the queen and speaking in French, this is in order to make us Christians stink. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. I'm going to open up this to a discussion for a moment. How do you think, how would you answer this statement? It's there. It's in the Talmud. So what would you say if you had to answer this question about the Talmud blaspheming and speaking this way about Jesus? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Elisheva? You have to unmute yourself. Well, we don't have a hell like that. And we don't have a hell where you're boiled in excrement. That doesn't exist when you, you talk about what we think happens next. It's in the Talmud. Right? Yes. The Paris, so then how do you explain it? Well, I would oh. say, well, you know, perhaps the, the rabbi was having, uh, not the rabbi, whoever wrote it, was uh, having an angry moment, but um, because I, I would I would say that that could be debated based on the fact that that's not how we look at things. Okay, okay. good. And Thank we do you. debate these things. I mean, I yeah. don't personally. I'm not clever enough, but yeah. You know. Okay, excellent. <laughs> good, good answer. Okay. Any other suggestions? Thank you, Ali Sheva. Okay, Elaine. I have never heard of that. That's obviously not said very often. Obviously, it's not what? No. Obviously, it's not very uh, brought about to coming this far. Have you, I mean, is that something that people can read easily in the Talmud? Yeah, it's right there for anyone to see. Oh, I mean, it's true that certain. It's true that certain um, versions of the Talmud. Um, censored it. The Christian censors of the Talmud probably censored it, but it's, you know, it's readily available. Yeah. And it's, it was available then. Yeah. Um, so I, t I take it that you're, you're, the rabbi of your synagogue has never gotten up and spoken about this. <laughs> okay. Makes for an interesting sermon. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dove. You have to unmute yourself, Dove. I'm trying to, uh, here we go. Unmute yourself, though. Okay. Um, 
What I would say is, look, this was before the church, before the church, before anything. That was those Christians in the old days who didn't have a right. But now you guys, that was before anything. But those Christians were still called themselves Jews. But now it's fine. We don't believe that about today's Christians and what right, they're that's doing. A, right. That's a very good answer in terms of negative things the Talmud may say about Christians. Right. But this is about Jesus. Uh, he is being punished by boiling in excrement. Well, I would say the same thing, you know, that because they understood Jesus the way the Christians then told him Jesus was. But now that we understand it the way you tell us. Uh, you know, okay. Like, All right. That's fancy footwork. Excellent. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. All right. So if I ever get called to a disputation, I'm going to call Elisheva and Dove to join me. Okay. Any other suggestions before we get to what Rabbi Chila Paris said? All right, let's get back to what he had to say. He said as follows. He says as follows. For the last 15 years, uh, for the last 15 years, since you were separated from us, you have sought to ensnare us. We will not succeed. This Jesus mentioned here by the Talmud is another Jesus, not the one who Christians worship. This was a certain Jesus who mocked the words of the sages and believed only in the written scripture like you. That's a little bit of a jab. You can tell this because he is not called Jesus of Nazareth, but simply Jesus. So that is, that's a classic response, is that we're not talking about the same guy. Like Dove said, we're not talking about the same Christians. We're not talking about the same Jesus. Your Jesus, we don't talk about. This Jesus was a pain in our neck, and so that's what we say about him. The problem is that Donin, who knew his Talmud, then says, very well, I will now read out a, a passage which does say Jesus of Nazareth. Churchmen, give your attention to this and see how this people which lives amongst you despises your deity. The Talmud says, when Jesus went forth to be stoned, a herald went out before him for 40 days, crying, Jesus the Nazarene goes forth to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and enticed to idolatry and perverted others of Israel. Anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and speak in his favor. So here you see that his answer is uh, not, uh, not known. I saw some other scholarship which says essentially Donin uh, stuck to his guns and said, um, uh, no, again, that's, that's also not the same uh, Jesus. Uh, it was a common name like Frank. There are lots of, probably lots of Jesuses living in Nazareth. And it's not necessarily the, uh, not necessarily the same, the same person. And, and so that's one of the major claims. And this is one of the major answers that he gives that it's not the same, uh, same Jesus. Um, I, I want to uh, spend a few minutes on the Kina itself that was written. So we're not going to look at the rest of the, uh, we're not going to look, uh, we'll actually just look at one more thing um, that he claims that uh, also, uh, here is another passage which both Jesus and Mary are blaspheming. The passage says that someone called Ben Stada, otherwise known as Ben Pandira, was hanged in Lida on the eve of Pesach. His mother's name was Miriam, the hairdresser. Her husband's name was Papos Ben Judah, and her lover's name was Pandira. So Mary is called an adulteress by the Talmud. And so Yechiel says, it's not the same Mary. The Miriam mentioned in the passage quoted by Donan cannot be the same person as Mary, for the locality mentioned is Lida, not Jerusalem, where Jesus' death took place. Moreover, Jesus is not even mentioned by name in this passage, but Ben Stata or Ben Pandira, also Mary's husband was called Joseph, and this Mary's husband was called Papos Ben Judah. Also, Mary the hairdresser is mentioned elsewhere in the Talmud as living in the days of Rav Papa and Abaye, who lived 700 years after Jesus. So this is the sort of general methodology uh, that Yechiel of Paris uses. Okay. There's, there's some more of this. Uh, some of them were along the lines of what Dove said, uh, that Christians in general were blasphemed. Um, but again, there he would simply say, no, those were different Christians. Those were pagans. We're not talking about them. You are very different. Now let's turn. At the end, it, none, none of this helped. None of Yechiel of Paris's defense of the Talmud helped, and the Talmud was condemned to be uh, burnt 
uh, in Paris, and it took place, as we said, in 1242. And we have an entire kina which is related to it, Sha'ali Srufa Ba'esh. Inquire, consumed in fire, after the well-being of your mourners who so strongly desire to reside in your dwellings. And it's a, a lament about uh, what happened that day, written by someone who may have been there and seen it, uh, um, Rav, uh, the Maharam of Rotenberg, who I told you about, who ended up dying, uh, dying in prison. Um, and there are some very powerful uh, things in this, uh, in this kina. I want to share uh, just one or two of them uh, with you and then redo something from, uh, from Rabbi Salavich. Uh Just give me one minute. Here we go. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble locating it amongst my mess. Uh, here it is. Okay. So there is a really powerful uh, statement uh, that's made in this kina. It says right here, uh, I hope you could see the uh, cursor, Sinai. Ha'al kein b'cha b'achar Elohim u'ma'as b'gdolim v'zarach b'gvulayich liyot lemofet ledat ki titma'et v'tered mechvoda which means Sinai. Is this why you were chosen by God, higher mountains rejected and your borders favored? Were you to be an omen that the Torah would be reduced and lowered from its glory? This is such a fascinating, uh, a fascinating uh, piece of this uh, in the sense that um, this is based on the Midrash, right? That uh, God chose Sinai not because it was the tallest mountain, but specifically because it was a very, it was a low mountain to teach us the importance of humility. And that's where Torah rests, with people are, who, who are humble. But then the Maharam of Rotenberg turns it on his face and said, maybe that's why God chose you, Sinai, because he was foreshadowing this day on which the Talmud and the Torah was going to be lowered and debased and embarrassed. And is that meaning... It, it, it turns the whole thing upside down. At first, we thought that the, the be, Sinai being chosen was a sign of the greatness of the Torah. And here, perhaps, we're seeing that Sinai being chosen is a foreshadowing of how Torah is going to be destroyed and how Torah is going to be uh, debased. Uh, and and th there's one other one that I want to show you. Here, Echa, where he says, he says, how can that which was given in a divine consuming fire be consumed by a fire kindled by mortals? Right? We're talking about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Gemara uh, that says uh, that, that, God is a consume, that God is a consuming fire. Right? And that uh, if you walk, if you get too close to God, you'll be singed. So we have this, the Torah, which is given in a consuming fire, uh, but n which is, it's, a, it's a divine fire, but nonetheless is, is, is susceptible to the fire of a basar vadam, is susceptible to the fire of a human being. Uh, and, and so again, he's, he, in, this, in this passage too, Michiel of Paris, I'm sorry, the Marav of Rotenberg, takes the, what we thought was the greatness of Torah and uses that same image to ask how it could be possible that the Torah could be brought to such a lowly level. Um, finally, I want to share with you uh, what Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote about this kina, because it's really important for us to keep this, to keep this in mind. We read this kina on Tisha B'Av. Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, asks as follows, why... Why the fuss about this on Tisha B'Av? The event did not include the destruction of lives. As we saw, Blanche promised that they'd be protected, and she kept her word. The Jews were not killed here. Only the destruction of parchment. The answer is simple. If this happened in our time, of course we would mourn, but the future of Knesset Yisrael would not be threatened. If the king told us to destroy all our books, of course it would be terrible. Of course, 
we would act like mourners, but the future of the Jewish people would, be in da- would not be in danger. I mentioned this in a class I gave to Melton this morning, right? If you see behind me all of my, my books, right? This is their, the second or third incarnation of these books because many of them were destroyed in two floods. But okay, that's very terrible and made me very sad, but I got my insurance check and I repurchased all the books again. But this event in 1242 happened before the printing press. These were all manuscripts. So once they were gone, they were gone forever, which meant much of the Tosafist, the French Tosafist material and works of halakha that they wrote were gone forever. I said, I mentioned that um, one of the rabbis wrote Sefer Mitzvah Hagadol, which tried to get back some of that material, but by and large, it's gone, gone forever. So that's what Soloveitchik says. We will be able to reproduce the books. But remember that the event described here occurred before printing was invented. All the books were in manuscript form and were very expensive. In the Middle Ages, when the Vatican said that they, the book written in Hebrew letters must be burned, destroyed, this meant that there was a very real serious danger that Torah knowledge would be lost. The Bali HaTosafot, the Tosafist, and the Maharam of Rotenberg, who wrote the Kina, considered this tragedy to be a major catastrophe for the fear. They feared that without these transcripts, the Torah Sheba al the oral law, would be forgotten. And of course, without the oral law, there is no Judaism. This kina was written in a very pessimistic mood. You can feel the Maharam's fear that the Torah might be forgotten. He, he and the Torah scholars of his time considered this to be a catastrophe of the magnitude, perhaps far greater and more menacing than the destruction of the Holy of Holies. That's really a very bold statement. Again, the Holy of Holies did not mean the end of Judaism. But Rabbi Salvechik considered it to be one of the great miracles of Jewish history that the oral law and Judaism survived this terrible event. So in our minds, it doesn't seem to be so much. What's 20 cartloads? A book is a book. You could just click on Amazon. I could have 20 cartloads delivered to my house literally before Shabbos starts. But it was, that's not the way things were then. It's a little bit before the printing press and also a little bit before Amazon. Uh, and so, but now we understand the buildup to this. This was a two-year buildup. Yechil of Paris tried as hard as he could at this, uh, at this disputation to uh, try to avoid uh, this event, but he couldn't. And it was terribly traumatic. The Maram of Rottenberg likely witnessed it and wrote a kina to, um, to lament it. And that is the history uh, uh, be, be behind one of the saddest events in Jewish history and one of the things that we mourn on this day. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for joining this class. Um, and I want to, I'm going to stop this recording so that we could start a new recording for uh, Rabbi Teller.